trapped in their own homes for more than two weeks. That was the reality for people living in a public housing complex in the South End, while the building's only elevator was broken down. Now, that elevator was fixed after 15 days, and elderly and disabled residents were finally able to leave the building. But... It was a rough two weeks without that elevator, and public housing buildings across Greater Boston have faced similar problems. That's as Brookline public housing resident Arlene Hill knows all too well. She joins me now along with Philip Hillman, a member of the strategy team at the Greater Boston Interface Organization and the administrator of the Boston Housing Authority, Kenzie Bach. Welcome to the table here. I appreciate y'all being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I mean, Kenzie, I, I have to ask you first. I mean, I imagine hearing the complaints, hearing those stories. I mean, you're the buck. A lot of folks, I will say, characterize this as the buck stops with you all. Absolutely. And, you know, for me, um, I started as administrator at the Boston Housing Authority a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously having this happen so early, it has just totally focused me on how we can do better. Um, the BHA has a lot of great protocols in place. We put tenant record coordinators at the bottom of a staircase to help people with groceries and mail in these situations. We did actually move several of those residents to hotels um, as the period lengthened. But the reality is, it's exactly as our residents said, you know, it's just not a way that we want people to be living. And we want to figure out ways that we can have these elevators be much more dependable. I mean, this was a, a real, like, specific crisis and and the frustration of not being able to get the part that we needed to replace this was just beyond. Um, but obviously, we're looking at everything to try to figure out how do we get as many of these vulnerable elevators in a better state as we can. Of course, the limitation is the pennies on the dollar that we get given um, in capital funding to do this work. Is, well, Arlene, you, you know. It's not just elevators. I yeah. broke my wrist last Christmas because my front three steps were crumbling and falling apart. But my director, too, of my housing, cares about us. I know he does. It's not their fault. It's not like they got money and they're sitting on it saying, we're not going to spend it on you. The state hasn't historically given us what we needed. Phil knows. He's a, he's a money remember guy. Oh, okay. I just know it's a lot. But <laughs> Phil can tell you, it's a yeah. lot of money the state hasn't put into us over a long period of time. All right, well, Phil, tell us. <laughs> well, when we talk about things like uh, ongoing maintenance yeah. and, and this is the issues like elevators and that's the tragedy that this has been benign neglect for a long period of time and so the number the need is really 184 million operating subsidy for statewide for public housing mm. and right now we're at 107 uh, which has gone through the legislation but the greater need is 184. Now, on top of that, we have capital issues mm. with the public housing, and we need 8.5 billion. I know that seems like a lot, but just that's in Massachusetts. Just in Massachusetts, and this is truly just the need. Uh, we've done a lot of work and a lot of study to put that number together. And when you go back and look at the years of maintenance that just wasn't done, and you got things like roofs, heating large ticket items that are in need to bring buildings back up to code. Mm. So we've got a lot of work to do, but there's hope. We believe that the bond bill coming out may be in a position to help us to address some of these needs. So we're really looking forward to what the governor will be bringing forward as her bond bill. And, Kenzie, I know that, that Massachusetts has a, large, a larger if not the largest amount of public housing in the country. So then how do you wrap your arms around numbers like in the billions like Philip is talking about? Yeah, I mean, it's huge. So Boston Housing Authority is the biggest housing authority mm -hmm. in the region. And for us across federal and state public housing, just at BHA, we've got about one and a half billion in deferred capital. So, I mean, it's an enormous uh, problem. You know, I think it's a combination of we're always going to just try to chip away at it day by day. Like mm -hmm. our residents, like the ones that you saw there, they just, they deserve better. So, you know, for instance, this elevator here, we're upgrading like the, over the course of this fall. And now because we saw how it failed, we're also upgrading the three that are its sisters that came in at the same time because we're sort of like, okay, well, if this one failed, then there's probably a similar problem. Ironically, 
even though it's 20 years old, it's one of the newer elevators in our system. Mm. So, you know, it's like, okay, we can be proactive about saying, no, let's just not do the one, let's do the four. But across my portfolio, I've got 105 elevators. Like, so I, I think it's a combination of you need your public housing authorities doing everything they can and being smart about our money and really like trying to get ahead of problems like this. But at the same time, we just need more resources. Yeah, I think it's a problem of the state, the country. They don't look at people who are older, are disabled, uh, come from trauma, have issues. We're the others. Mm. We're the great others that no one likes to think about, uh, puts us in a box that we don't belong in. You know, we were talking, Arlene, about I grew up in public housing in Springfield. And when you're in a situation where you have a need for the building, the only home you have, and can't get that met, it's very frustrating. Yes. You mentioned you broke your wrist recently. Talk to me about, you know, what you've experienced in the past in public housing. I love where I live. Yeah. I have the whole world, every nationality, every type of person. I really love where I live. The people are great. But it's so demoralizing. My ceiling fell on my face two different times, the ceiling. They just don't have the money, and our voices are not heard. I, I don't want to say why, but this year I've met with the governor. I was very impressed, and she listened to me, and she cared. I feel like people are starting to care. People are beginning to say they deserve good housing, too, healthy housing, just healthy is good enough. I don't need mm -hmm. lawns and things like that. <laughs> I just need healthy houses. Yeah. Um, Phil, as we, or Philip rather, as we look at the numbers, you know, and, and the work that the organization is doing to secure that funding, what are the conversations like with lawmakers as you're trying to get this parts of the bond yeah. bill? Excellent question. Yeah. Because when we first started out, we started to recognize early on that this was below the radar screen, mm. that we were doing as much education around this issue as we were getting them to get on board. So once we started to get, you know, a critical mass of people who actually understood what we were talking about in terms of deferred maintenance, mm -hmm. capital needs, uh, we found that we had a lot of partners in the legislature that worked with us to help us advance our agenda for it. But the greater piece was not really having this on that radar screen. And that was, in the beginning, disheartening. But I think GBIO has done an excellent job of getting this up to the forefront and getting people to see this. We recently had a, um, an event where we had 1,400 people. Mm. Uh, and we were talking specifically about the campaign. And we had the uh, lieutenant governor was there, the mayor attended. And I think that also would serve us well in terms of people understanding we're here for the long run. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think what, what Phil's saying about visibility is so important. I mean, especially with housing costs going where they are in Boston, yes. like, it's really our public housing communities that are the communities that are anchoring people in place in the city. I mean, mm -hmm. low income people, yes, but also just seniors and families with children. Like you're getting to a place where if you don't have two six figure earners, you can't afford an apartment. That's right? right. And so we're the ones in public housing that are really like anchoring folks and making sure kids can still grow up in the city. Folks can still grow old in the city. Um, but I think sometimes there's been this orientation where it's like public housing's just there and people it's sort of people just like it's out of sight, out of mind. And mm -hmm. so I think really bringing, you know, our residents forward and talking about their needs and also talking about what assets they are to the community and like how much it means to anchor them here in place. I think it's a really important shift. How do you manage in terms of the responsibility when you have a situation like this that obviously is high visibility, but there are different aspects and layers to the management of these properties, whether it be federal, whether it be state, and whether it be just specifically BHA. Like how do you manage all the players in a situation like this, especially when, you know, you have to access the money, you have to access some sort of workflow to keep the maintenance up on these buildings. 
Yeah, so I think it always has to be a balance of being responsive to the immediate situation, um, you know, like I mentioned, right? So that's yeah. tent coordinators, getting people to hotels, you know, communication. We can always do better on those things, and, and there's definitely a piece of the work that's sort of doing an after action and saying, what could we do better here? Then it's how do I specifically address this elevator? Like I said, how do I address the ones that are in the same generation? Um, but then we also have to play the long game of how are we going to get the kind of money where we're not always behind? Because to right. exactly your point, you know, we could focus on this elevator today and then another one across the system goes out tomorrow. Uh, and so, you know, what I'm always trying to do right now, especially as I um, get into this role, is to try to solve the specific problem, but then try to figure out what's the lesson for our overall system mm -hmm. um, about being more responsive. And, and, you know, I think for the BHA, we're always going to try to do everything we can with the resources we can, but then we need advocates who are pushing for us to just have more resources and give our people what they deserve. How would you describe the general condition of the housing in the authority? I think, you know, folks in, in my staff work incredibly hard to keep up our apartments. I mean, just like Arlene was saying, then frankly, people who work in public housing, like they're there for the heart of it. You mm -hmm. can make more money doing something else. These days you can work remote. Like if you're working in person, it, doing this work is because you care about people. I'll testify to that. They yeah. do great people But I think, yeah. I think what we see is it's one thing to take care of the smaller things. Like no amount of staff work is going to solve a roof that has holes in it. Mm -hmm. And and the problem is that then you start to get, if you get water inside the envelope, that's where you start to get mold. That's where you start to get these other issues. So I, I think staff work really hard, but it's the big picture issues. We're hoping actually that the focus on green retrofits and therefore on building envelopes can help us finally really tackle some of these big systems issues in public housing. So if you had to give a grade between A being good and F being failing, what would you, what would you say? Well, I think, I mean, with... I, with the resources we have, I yeah. think our people are doing absolutely everything that they can. I think that $1.5 billion behind where we're supposed to be in yeah. terms of capital resources, I mean, that's obviously not an A when it comes to, like, federal support and state support for what we need to be doing. Yeah. I'll say the people are an A, the historically ignorance of us is a D. Yeah, okay, I appreciate <laughs> we're that. We're changing that, and that's, yeah. you know, GBI was really helped me. And having that place, having the door I could lock when I came from trauma yeah. meant the world for me and allowed me to get healthy and grow. We will always need state housing. All the immigrants coming in, they'll need places to stay. You know, we need public housing. Only four states mm -hmm. in the whole country country have public housing. We're very lucky. I would say this is the best state. Yeah. Because it is. And as we look, uh, Philip, about the, the as the folks on the state house and looking into funding that, what would be your message to them? I think it's time to get creative. Yeah. I think it's time to recognize we're in a crisis mode. We cannot afford to lose any units. We have immigration issues that we're trying to resolve in terms of finding people housing. And finally, we want safe, dignified, quality housing for everyone yeah. in this state. Everyone Excellent. deserves a home. Perfect. Well, thank you all for coming. This is obviously a conversation we could have for a long time, and we'll continue to do so. So thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah.